St. Lucia joins the rest of the world in observing the first official United Nations World Wetlands Day in 2022. As part of national activities to commemorate the day, February 2nd, a panel discussion has been convened here and now by the Department of Sustainable Development with support from partner agencies to highlight the condition of our island country's wetlands, specifically our mangroves, and the ongoing efforts to stop and reverse its decrease and degradation. So here we are. Hello and welcome. My name is Jessie Leons from the Department of Sustainable Development and I will be steering this panel. I'm joined by a distinguished cadre of environmental executives and experts who have understood today's assignment and are ready to provide meaningful contributions. So just to bring you through their names at this time, we do have a Ms. Makiba Felix, she is a fisheries biologist from the Department of Fisheries. We have Mr. Jeremiah Edmund, an officer within the Sustainable Development and Environment Division within the Department of Sustainable Development. We have Mr. Vincent Clark, head ranger for the Point Sab Environmental Protection Area uh, with the National Trust, and Ms. Magdalene Jerson, a forestry officer within the Department of forestry and we also have lined up for later on in this broadcast but in studio uh, mr john calix coordinator uh, with the southeast coast project and he's also attached to the sustainable development department and we have mr craig henry uh, chief executive officer within the national conservation fund greetings all and thank you for availing yourselves for the occasion i want to start with uh, Mr. Edmund from the Department of Sustainable Development. Uh, for the benefit of our viewership, if you could provide us with a working definition of wetlands, as well as providing a layout of St. Lucia, St. Lucia's wetland sites. Okay, good morning. Good day all. Um, simpler definition I would give is a wetland is an area, be it natural or artificial, which is either flooded or swamp area, either for part of a, partly for some time or permanent. Um, you have different types of wetlands, you have categories, so you have swamps, you have marshes, and you have mangroves. They fall under the, the different categories and they have different functions, but all of them are equally important in in environmental um, functions and providing ecosystem services, whether it be regulating or provisional or others. Um, so in St. Lucia, we don't have many swamps remaining or marshes, but we have a lot of mangroves. Well, not a lot, but we have mangroves. Um, our largest mangrove is Makwete in the south. It's about 60 hectares in area, and it's an important nursery uh, for fish and other bird species, some migratory bird species that come there during their migratory patterns. We have other areas, I think, in the Pusepa, I think it's Point Sab, we have another mangrove. We have mangroves at Chalk, we have in Border Wars, you have at Kazaba, you have at Esperus in Moshi. You have at Marquis um, in Barbono, you have Monrepo, you have Prale, and you have Black Bay. So we have quite a number of mangroves scattered along our coastlines um, in St. Lucia. And some of them are more degraded than others, but efforts are being made to try to reverse this degradation and conserve these mangroves because they provide ecological functions as well as provide livelihood opportunities for many St. Lucians. <coughs> so I okay. think I will leave it there. Okay, and uh, coming to you, Ms. Jerson, uh, Mr. Edmund mentioned uh, degradation. Uh, speak to us about the conditions of our wetlands in St. Lucia. 
what what does it look like? Uh, what has happened over the past few decades um, when we talk about uh, human activity and so on, climate change as well? A lot of times when we speak wetlands, we zero in quickly to the mangroves. Mm -hmm. And I know we're celebrating um, Wetlands Day and we usually focus on the sites of international importance. Yes. But they're not the only wetlands that we have. And the condition of our wetlands are ju is just as troubling as the sites of international importance. So we'll deal with one first and then the other. Um, there is a saying that if we do not, if, if, if environmental protection takes precedence over economy, the country will die. And I think that has fueled a lot of the decisions that have been taken in regards to conserving wetlands. There's a lot of destruction that has taken place over the past several years particularly to our mangroves because of where they're located on the coast. They find themselves as targets because they're usually in very prime location for development. And so if a, if a developer, whoever he be, expresses interest, usually the mangrove is sacrificed. Um, so you have a lot of degradation that has happened you have areas where we have lost entire seafronts because the mangrove that existed at that point to protect surges and to protect from storms disappeared. You have areas where private owners have claimed portions of seafront because they claim it to be their property. Um, there are instances in my experience where I have gone to an area where you used to have mangrove, and there's a, a, a lock number inside of the seawater. The lot is being sold from the high water mark. It's been measured from there. You have instances where you have massive trees that I've seen, diameter so big that my arms can't go around them, and they've been cut to accommodate housing schemes, to accommodate hotel development. The destruction that we're talking about is scary. There are areas where we used to have mangroves, I'll say view fort, and not necessarily Makote, but within Pasipa, where you've had to have hard bricks placed in the, in the ocean because what used to be there was mangrove that protected us. We have extreme sea level rise happening, and there's nothing to shield us. A, 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 a district like Viewfort that is really below sea level already. When you have situations like the Christmas troth of 2013, and huge portions of road disappearing, we believe that it, it's a freak incident. But no, mangrove was cut to make way for development. And that is what obtains in St. Lucia. If the thought pattern is not changed, we're going to have a situation where this, almost this entire country will be inundated by seawater and our life will be forever changed. Thanks for that, Ms. Jusen. We're going to get into a little bit more expanding on the extent and the impact of development in just a bit, and as well as the legislative provisions, because you mentioned uh, about the um, claims to, to, to well, land ownership and, and, and the situation surrounding that in just a bit. Uh, but Ms. Uh, Makiba, I want to, to, to get to you now as a fisheries biologist to come to some of the misconceptions that we have uh, around, that surround wetlands. Uh, of course, towards leaning towards reducing their value overall. I could give you one, perhaps, the fact that, um, of course, for the purpose of debunking, for instance, swamp, dirty water, poor water quality, perhaps affecting our environment overall. Uh, in your debunking, uh, outline the significance of these habitats from a biological and environmental perspective, a bit more than Mr. Edmund did initially. Mm -hmm. So in St. Lucia and many places globally, a lot of people believe that the mangroves are breeding grounds for animals such as mosquitoes and other infectious animals 
but this is not the case. The mangroves provide a lot of ecological benefits, economic benefits, and biological benefits to the local communities. In terms of ecological benefits, the mangroves act as nurseries, and they mm -hmm. are a breeding ground for a lot of marine organisms, such as fish and other aquatic organisms. They also provide coastal and shoreline protection and stabilization during hurricanes and flooding events. They are also used for the economic benefits. They are used for timber. They are used for charcoal production. And they also provide a lot of regulatory services. They are mitigated for climate change, and they help with the reduction in the atmospheric carbon dioxide. They trap the carbon dioxide in the soils and in the roots of their structures. Okay, thanks for that uh, outline. Of course, definitely um, showing and highlighting the significance of wetlands overall uh, from, as you mentioned, not only ecological but economic as well. Um, a lot of these misconceptions have implications. And Mr. Clark, I want to come to you with that as someone who actually works on the ground at the Point Sab Environmental Protection Area. Speak to us about the implications of these misconceptions. What have you observed at, at your site? Um, how have these notions and these thoughts that perhaps, you know, the, 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 the swamps are, the, the wetlands are breeding grounds for mosquitoes and pe people perhaps have less of an appreciation for wetlands. So how has this translated to human behavior impacting our wetlands. A lot of people believe that mangroves are just a, a dumping area for garbage. So people do not respect mangroves and say, okay, this is just trees and shrubs that grow there, and I will just dump anything from anywhere in there. What they don't understand that is if you destroy the mangrove, one, you have a lot of carbon, footprints will be, not be stored, you have um, sulfuric gas will be exposed to the atmosphere. So when you destroy mangrove, the mud there is still with sulfuric gas, and this will actually go back all the way to the atmosphere. So if we're going about um, protecting wetlands, all these things have to be taken into consideration and educate the public about this, why wetlands is so important. If I may add, um, Makiba, I think one of the challenges, one of the main challenges is, as long as there is not a house on it or not a development, People assume it's supposed to be a free-for-all that we can either dump our trash or we can squat on it and not understand that it has a significance. Wetlands gain, the, the, the type of wetland is determined by what its water source is. Um, say for instance, we're referring to mangroves. Mangroves are a type of swamp. They belong to the, to the swamp category and swamps usually receive their water from two points. They receive their water, some of it will be salt, some of it will be fresh. Now, typically, the salt water is a constant. It's always there. <laughs> but there's all, almost always interruption with the fresh water. And while the trees within uh, that particular area are salt tolerant, Many of them are not des designed to be complete in completely saline conditions. It's supposed to be a brack brackish situation. One of the challenges, say for instance, that um, as Jeg was describing in Pacipa, is that the fresh water supply to this particular river has all but been cut. It has been dammed completely. Private persons in the area where um, that led up to this, this, the stream, dammed the water for the pigs, for domestic use, for various purposes, and you have very little fresh water coming in. This is a, a, a ravine, and I mean, I will speak to a lot of persons who will remember this growing up in Viewfort, or living in Viewfort. This is a, a ravine that typically, if you were on one side of it when it rained, the overflow was so huge that you could not cross. You had to remain on one or either side of it. That phenomenon has all but stopped because enough, of fr enough fresh water isn't coming down anymore. Now, once you interrupt the fresh water supply into a swamp, you, you've created a bottleneck and species are going to die. The, the, the hydric soil that um, Vincent referred to, you don't have hydric soil anymore. 
because hydric soil is not designed to be a completely saline soil. And so it becomes almost a poison because it is too salty. There is supposed to be a, a, a refreshing that happens. If the sea constantly brings the life, the story that is told by the absence of the fresh water is that somebody in the ridge that he spoke about, somebody in the, in the ridge part of it has messed up. What we're supposed to do, what is supposed to concern us the most in this country because our entire water supply comes from our ridges. And if the fresh water supply is being interrupted, it means that management isn't happening. And we are in serious, we potentially are in serious trouble. So it, is, it, be, it becomes a problem when persons figure, this area is empty, let me construct on it. Let me build on it and not understand that it's a cyclical experience that we have. Mm -hmm. Everything is tied together. And the behavior of one messes up the other one. Thank you for that. And we have to stick a pin in that. So we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about the impact as well as the actions that are being taken. The theme for this year's observance is wetlands action for people and nature. We will delve a little bit into that. Of course, that's grounded in an appeal uh, for financial, human, and political capital to save the world's wetlands. And we will speak a little bit about St. Lucia's peculiar effort. Stay with us. by the UN General Assembly last year, when it designated the 2nd of February as World Wetlands Day, a moment to raise awareness of wetlands' importance for a sustainable and prosperous future. World Wetlands Day is an opportunity to engage all stakeholders at all levels to strengthen and multiply action for wetlands, whether by championing conservation, redirecting public and private funding streams, transforming agricultural practices, reducing water waste, contributing to restoration efforts, or supporting local wetland cleanups, we can all take action. Thank you so much for staying tuned. This is a panel discussion in observance of World Wetlands Day 2022. We do have a panel, a distinguished panel of experts and executives from various partner, from various agencies here in St. Lucia. This is an event that is being hosted by the Department of Sustainable Development to highlight the uh, situation with our wetlands here on island, as well as the efforts that are ongoing uh, to improve and to reduce uh, degradation. Before we went to break, uh, we were discussing the impact uh, for on St. Lucia's wetlands, uh, of course, our peculiar situation in terms of human activity. And uh, we were just rounding off with some word from uh, Ms. Gerson before we, we had an interjection from uh, Mr. Clark. He wanted to make a point in terms of the impact of uh, human activity on our wetlands before we move on to the actions that are being taken by policymakers, uh, persons on the ground for the, from the Department of Forestry and Fisheries. Yeah, uh, the impact of wetlands like with humans, right? Especially um, ro um, rivers and streams leading to mangrove, like Magdalene Sea. A lot of the um, environmental impact assessment when it comes to mangrove and waterways leading to mangrove is not being actually addressed in the proper way because they just see like, like my say, a hotel can be there. When you destroy the waterway to the wetlands, it will divert the water in a different area. The different area can be detrimental to you by causing a village of flooding in the different areas. So if you look at, if you look at Denry, the Denry is a typical example. You have the school, the police station, and that was a wetland area. 
mangrove mm -hmm. was growing next to it on the other side, which would control and take the water as a basin. Look at what happened in, in Denry. Anytime it rains, because of the diversion flow of the water through the mangrove and destroy the mangrove, Denry is always flooded. So this is one of the impacts so like developers have to take in consideration. The waterways into mangrove must not be tolerated and tempered with at all. Mm -hmm. Okay, and coming back to uh, the extent and um, the impact of the development with you, Ms. Gerson, um, we have two um, wetlands of international significance. Mm -hmm. If you could just touch on that a little bit uh, and what actions would need to be taken for us to maintain protection of these sites. Um, the, there are several um, concerns and several possible actions. At the very top of it, will have to be giving the, the bodies that manage these areas. And we're talking about Mahote Mangrove and the Savants Bay. Um, approximately 85 hectares of, of land. Um, the, the agencies that manage these areas have almost no teeth in their legislation to take action. And in many instances, at least in my experience over the past 25 years, it's always been a hot potato with persons shifting from blame or responsibility from one to the other because perhaps the persons who are interested in doing a thing, their agency, their legislation is not strong enough or does not speak to it. And then the agency that actually has legislation, it's not a, a priority. So one of the first things that needs to happen is the legislation needs to be strengthened. And I don't know any time when legislation is ever strengthened if the policymakers do not agree with the thought or the, the purpose for which you're speaking to them. So we have to convince the policymakers that if we don't change the way we're doing things, it's going to be detrimental to us. The second thing is land tenure is a serious con situation. Who owns the land on which the mangroves or the wetland exists. I think one of the, the other things that needs to happen is it needs to be policy that the crown, quote unquote, has power and make these areas reserve. Another thing that needs to happen is people need to be held accountable for their behavior and their actions. In the past, and like I've said, I've had a lot of experience dealing with situations where persons perform acts that are heinous acts of, of dumping. And Mine. the persons who are supposed to go in and intervene, there is no follow through with the powers that be to hold persons accountable. I'm trying to be very diplomatic and technical so I don't give details, but I'm telling you I'm boiling under the surface because I have so many experiences of discovering garbage, identify that this is this agency who has dumped it, but I am I am unable to do anything, Jesse, because I work for a, a, an agency that does not have legislation that supports me arresting a person. You see what I mean? So one of the first things that, that needs to happen is we need to get our act together in terms of how important this is to us, what it would mean for our survival, for, our, for the future generations, and then give authority to individuals to actually hold persons accountable for their actions and politicians not get involved and unapologetically. Politicians not get involved because this is a situation that we faced in the past where persons are brought to bear for something they've done and intervention happens based on who is, is, is being supported by whom. And therefore, persons believe that um, when I do it, I've had situations where I encountered a man with a grader in a protected area. And when I spoke to him, he says to me, oh, 
Mr. Clark, can you attest to that? Have you had experiences where you find persons in contravention? Yes, several times at the Makoti Mango. And our last incident was with the police. And he came with his friends to actually cut down the mangrove, unsustainable cutting. And when we approach him, he told us that, oh, um, there is nothing that you could do. I will just have, I'll, I'm just going to call the commissioner. And then he called the commissioner right away. And then he drove off. So there is nothing that we couldn't do. So there is, Magdalene has uh, rights to say that. And we have been in contact with several different agencies that believe that because they are a government agency that they could come to the wetland and do whatever they want because they work for the government. So it is a lot of challenging in managing um, that site because you have no powers sometimes because you still have to go to the police to police the police. So it is challenging to actually manage the site on a sustainable way that you wish to. Even person's livelihoods has, has been tampered with with certain government agencies, I imagine they will come there mm -hmm. and will just do something because they are from the government, especially when they drive an SLG vehicle, I'll tell you, friend bank, they will come and say, oh, because you know that there's SLG's government, so there is nothing you could do because you have no power, they have more power than you. Mm -hmm. that so uh, an integrated approach is needed for oh, enforcement, urgently. Urgently. enforcement uh, increased awareness, sensitization of what is happening. Uh, we, before the, well, when we went to break, we exchanged one sustainable development and environment <laughs> officer for another. Uh, we now have, uh, well, uh, removing a Mr. Edmund for a while and putting in Mr. Calix, who is the coordinator for the Southeast Coast Project. Good day to you, thank you for being here. Um, we're talking awareness, increased awareness. We're talking about protection, conservation of our important sites, environmentally important sites. Uh, speak to us about the work of the Southeast Coast Project in advancing that effort. Okay, first I would just want to give a brief overview of the Southeast Coast Project and then you know respond to your question. Um, the South East Coast project is financed by the Global Environmental Facility, which we call GEF, and it has been implemented by the um, United Nations Environment Program, UNEP, in collaboration with the Department of Sustainable Development. And we work with many agencies, uh, the Ministry of Tourism, Ministry of Agriculture especially, and all of their departments um, are involved in the various components of the project. Um, the Ministry of Social Transformation, we work with other agencies such as the, um, the National Trust, um, the ICO Inter American um, ICA um, for Agriculture, um, the OECS, um, and we also work with some of the um, local groups in the areas, the community-based organizations, the Library Foundation. So, so as you mentioned earlier in your presentation, it is an integrated project, and therefore we have to work with several agencies to help us implement our activities. The main objective of the project is to encourage economic development of the Southeast Coast, whilst maintaining healthy ecosystems, which includes um, wetlands and quarries, etc., um, sustainable livelihoods, and by which try to ensure that we have global environmental benefits. Um, the actual area for the program or the project is from Mandele Point in Denry, and we go all the way into Labry. Um, there are three basic components of the project. The first one is what we call ecosystems management. Under that component, we, try, we build the capacity of the um, public and private sector, um, community residents, NGOs, and CBOs in the area to manage those ecosystems um, in the Southeast Coast. The second component is the rehabilitation of degraded landscapes. Um, and there, the project will provide support to working with the Department of um, um, Forestry to help rehabilitate our ecosystems that are damaged, including you know, um, um, mangroves and terrestrial ecosystems. And the third component is basically um, sustainable livelihoods. Um, we want to identify sustainable livelihoods in the, well, not just livelihoods, but economic opportunities that, that would assist with sustainable livelihoods in the project area and support um, people to actually access, you know, the residents access those, um, those opportunities. So in terms of um, rehabilitation and protection, one of the things we, we, we have to do as, as part of the project is through our communications program, where we uh, will be um, sensitizing and creating awareness of the importance of our ecosystems. Um, so of course, including wetlands and mangroves, um, not just the importance, but um, what happens, you know, what are the benefits from these ecosystems? 
and what happens when we um, degrade those ecosystems. So, Who are the stakeholders that are being engaged? Okay, so obviously we target the school, the school children, the school kids um, from primary to secondary and even tertiary. Um, we target the farmers, the fishermen, um, those individuals who actually utilize the, um, the services in these ecosystems. Um, so uh, beekeepers, um, charcoal makers, the tiny farmers, etc., um, and the general population, general community in the um, project area. Uh, so through our, our communications program, we'll be targeting these, these specific um, areas in the community um, for, for um, the awareness programs um, you know, through our program. Okay, understood. Um, coming back to you, Makiba, to, to speak a little bit about research that perhaps would have been done so far or is ongoing, because at the base of every point you want to make, it needs to be founded with research metric. Um, what work is happening now to uh, reflect a threat to our wetlands, or reflect a threat to our mangroves that can be used by policymakers, by um, teaching the teachers and so on, in an effort to get persons to understand, um, to effect policy change, legislation, etc. Well, currently there has been work done in investigating the water quality of the rivers and investigating just the general health of the mangrove trees in the areas. So a lot of the time, the mangrove, like Jeg and Magdalene mentioned earlier, a lot of the time the mangrove acts as a filter and it protects the coral reefs and the other marine organisms and other marine ecosystems from the pollutants that come down in the waterways. So that includes, it entraps litter, it traps pesticides and other harmful toxins and other harmful pollutants that could enter the waterways. So. Sometimes we go out and we investigate the quality of these, ecos of these ecosystems, we investigate the quality of the water, and we make note of different things like algal blooms in the area which could indicate a high level of nitrogen and phosphorus chemicals entering the waterways. And these could come from farmlands when the fertilizers enter the waterways. We also do investigation into the health of the mangrove trees, and this includes going out on, reg on a regular basis and just looking at the quality of the trees, the leaves, the investigating the growth, as well as any dieback that may be in the area. Okay, coming back to you, Ms. Jerson, mm -hmm. how effective is, is that information uh, for policymakers drafting papers and so on? And how effective is it in convicting the persons who, uh, convicting the hearts and minds of individuals who can, who have the power to make th those changes at a legislative level? Thus far, not very. Okay. Would you like me to expound? Please do. There's so much work that has been done. We have um, evidence as far back as the existence of Canary did so much work. We had the Cedar Project from um, so many decades ago where there's so much documentation that happened. There's information available to have inform the policymakers to make different decisions. Um, we have evidence of working with opicon charcoal producers, Forestry took that decision years ago, to work with opicon charcoal producers, um, mm -hmm. record, there's so much data that was com compiled, uh, describing how you can sustainably have livelihoods within the mangrove and ensure that the mangrove is not lost. However, we still end up with DSH. <laughs> like I said, the data has not been very effective <coughs> in informing policymakers on decisions that they need to take because you still have mass clearing, you still have decisions being taken to erect hotels in an area that if, if, if I have to expect my grandchildren to see them, if things continue the way they are, they will not experience Makote mangrove. They will not experience having Savants Bay as is. So the short answer, not very effective. We are, we are not giving up, however. 
I remember giving Mr. Kalix a hard time when his project was introduced because I've experienced so many projects that came over the years that sounded similar. And I am, I was, I'm extremely skeptical about the support that will be given to what needs to be done. We're not giving up, we're continuing, but it's, it is with very tender feet. Forestry at this moment is engaging in a project with South Lewis where we're going to begin to look at how much um, sequestration is actually happening within the, 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 the Makote mangrove, see if we can measure. Perhaps explaining to persons why a mangrove, a wetland, is a m much more effective medium for cleaning the air. If perhaps we can at attack it from that angle, maybe something will change. Because usually, we, we consider trees are our first line of defense. But recent information is, is having us know that wetlands do a far better job in storing carbon than terrestrial forests have traditionally done. Um, if you, in, in your research, you will discover that when you lose one inch of topsoil, it will take about 200 years to build that back. The information, which we know that this entire study is new, but the information that we're receiving and we're coming up with is that you can actually build back about a centimeter of, of soil a year, which means in five years, you would have gained what would have taken the forest a hundred years to build back. That seemed to be a, 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 a vital piece of information to help convince. So perhaps if we come, from, come at it from that angle, to tell people <coughs> that the heat that we're, we're experiencing, one of the main ways we can save ourselves from dying from overheating will be to preserve our wetlands. Perhaps if we come at it from that angle, maybe things will change. So we're not giving up, but it's not been easy. Okay, despite your tender feet, uh, projects like the Southeast Coast Project, as well as work ongoing by the uh, St. Lucia National Conservation Fund is ongoing, as well as many other partner agencies. But we do have the Chief Executive Officer who will be joining us after uh, this break. We're overdue. And we will also have Mr. Edmund coming back because we will be having our final segment directly after this break, talking about the actions that are being taken to protect our wetlands. And we conclude. Stay with us. We all know where water comes from. But have you ever wondered where water goes once it reaches the ground? Although it might stay still, water never stops moving through the earth. When water meets land, they merge together. This union is called wetlands. Lakes, rivers, swamps, floodplains, estuaries, mangroves, peatlands, shorelines, coral reefs. These are examples of wetlands. These environments are an important part of our daily lives and contribute to our well-being. They naturally filter and store water, making it available to the living world, including us. Wetlands are therefore extraordinarily rich and biodiverse ecosystems where life is bursting. They are home to 40% of the world's plants and animals. Half of all bird species depend on wetlands. And two-thirds of fish breed or live there. Wetlands are all around the planet, yet only cover 6% of the emerged lands. They are our most valuable ecosystems and play a crucial role in sustaining life on our planet. However, wetlands are being lost at an alarming rate. Since 1900, two-thirds of these vital areas have been destroyed. Seeing the need to protect wetlands and ensure their wise use, governments established in 1971 the Convention on Wetlands, which is the world's first international treaty focusing on a single ecosystem. 
Today, 50 years later, the convention has been adopted by 171 countries. Through the designation of protected areas, the implementation of effective policies, and the sharing of knowledge, the convention enables countries to take action to protect their wetlands and use them wisely. Wetlands provide clean water, essential for human consumption and production of food. They protect us from storms and floods. They store more carbon than all the world's forests combined, making them critical for addressing climate change. And importantly, more than one billion people living in cities and rural communities in all countries of the world depend on wetlands for their livelihood. We cannot afford to lose more wetlands. They are a powerful nature-based solution to the many challenges the world is facing. Taking action now for wetlands is foundational for creating the future we want. Over the past 50 years, the Convention on Wetlands has helped us better understand the value of these precious ecosystems. Through increasing awareness, knowledge and action on the ground, the Convention provides a clear way forward for taking action for wetlands. Wetlands protect life. Our future depends on wetlands. Thank you so much for staying tuned. We continue the conversation on wetlands here in St. Lucia, uh, the impact that human activity, climate change is having on these habitats as well as the work that is being done uh, to try to conserve those spaces. Uh, we have been having a lot of weigh in from our lead stakeholders uh, who've been trying to, uh, trying everything that they can in terms of restoring uh, some of the degradation that has happened to date. And of course, zoning in, zooming in on some of the uh, lack of awareness, the, the, the lack of sensitization, the sensitization that needs to be done here in St. Lucia so that persons can have a greater appreciation of our wetlands, more specifically our mangroves. And on that note, I want to go to go come back to uh, Mr. Calixt, who wanted to respond to the word from Ms. Jerson before we went to break. Uh, just want to mention before, though, that we do have uh, Mr. Edmund back on the platform, as well as the Chief Executive Officer from the St. Lucia National Conservation Fund joining us. Thank you so much for being here, sir. Of course, we're trying to smash in as many, as much input as we can to get a varied uh, understanding of our peculiar circumstance here in St. Lucia. So, Mr. Calix, the floor to you before we move on to the development and the actions that are being taken to improve our wetland situations that we face. Okay, just want to add that I think the Southeast Coast Project recognizes the importance of having information to make decisions. Um, in, our, in our first component, ecosystems management, which is the capacity of the public, private, and, and NGOs to manage ecosystems in the area, what we intend to do is to develop a management information system. So from all the... Um, consultancies that will be taking place um, on the project and um, information coming from our other partners you know, um, in the project area. We are going to design a database and in working in conjunction with the Department of Forestry and the Department of Physical Planning, um, create a management information system which will be accessible to government agencies, government ministries, individuals, um, the decision makers, the community residents themselves um, developers, so everybody will have access, I guess, at different levels um, to that information. Now, I'm not sure, Ms. Jason, what information or how it was stored, you know, from CEDA and, and the, other, um, the other agencies before. But we believe that having a good information system where people can actually access the information and so you can know, okay, where the mangroves are located, how many, um, where they are, the species, as Makiba pointed out, um, what is causing the dieback in these areas. So you have information at your fingertip to tell you or to help you to make a decision on a development, or it could be a, a hotel or just a housing development. So we're hoping that by working with um, physical planning department and forestry, we can have that information esta system established to assist decision making in the Southeast Coast project. <coughs> you also mentioned the issue of carbon sequestration and, and the importance of, if people understand the importance of um, those, those um, um, 
wetlands and mangroves in sequestering carbon. Um, they would better understand and appreciate the use of the, or the, the functionings of these um, ecosystems. I can tell you that one of, the, one of the components of our project as well is to calculate in terms of the, um, in the project area from all our rehab rehabilitation works coming from the forestry, the forests, uh, productive um, agricultural landscapes, the mangroves, et cetera, we'll also be undertaking a study to determine or to calculate um, in terms of everything that you have done in terms of um, rehabilitation. Um, so for instance, we, we are supposed to rehabilitate 2,500 hectares of um, productive forest areas um, and 5,000 hectares of marine ecosystems. So to measure the carbon sequestration from these two mm. activities. So I'm happy to be here that the um, South Coast Community College is also involved in that exercise. Um, so we can work with them because you, I think you're targeting just the SEPA, mm -hmm. but we're targeting the entire project area. Mm -hmm. So we can actually work with them as part of that exercise to you know, enhance our, our data collection you know, in that component. So, Great. So we have, so the project is going to be delivering some of the, on some of the concerns that you have addressed, all right? We want to you know, you know, address some of these concerns as part of the project. So. Cushioning Wonderful. with, I, I hope you, you are consoled by this cushioning of information and the initiatives. <laughs> and also from uh, the National Conservation Fund, uh, Mr. Henry, speak to us about uh, efforts on, on your end, your organization's end. Yeah, thank you, Jesse, for the invitation. Uh, I think it's been a, a very substantive discussion thus far. And I, I like to share uh, personally, and of course representing the Institution National Conservation Fund, um, the concerns um, with regards to the condition of our wetlands um, in St. Lucia. Uh, principally, I would remind um, our folks that the, the fund, we fundraise uh, to support um, what we call biodiversity natural resource management activities uh, or priorities in St. Lucia. So we are a unique institution devoted to um, supporting private and public institutions, the Forestry Department, Department of Sustainable Development, even the Opicon Charcoal uh, producers as a community groups. So we depend a lot on partnerships and we, we understand that it is through these strategic collaborations and partnerships that we can address some of the very important concerns with regards to our biodiversity and natural resources in San Lucia. If I speak specifically to um, wetlands management and wetlands conservation, um, I would be happy to announce as well right here that we are also partnering with the Forestry Department in putting together St. Lucia's first carbon offset project. And that delves into something that we are not quite familiar with or used in St. Lucia that deals with carbon sequestration. And that involves an area of mangrove that is also in private hands. So the level of partnership and collaboration and research that, that goes into putting together a project such as this is novel and it is something that even I myself is not familiar with. So just imagine the wider solution public. However, the important thing for us right now is to, again, go back to the issue of how we value and how we teach people to value our wetlands and the importance that they have. Even, even the policy makers and um, the political directorate, they too have to understand better and perhaps probably garner the will that we expect from them to take certain activity, certain actions or make certain decisions um, that would be in favor of preserving our wetlands. And so we are also engaged in conversations at that level uh, because we do understand that um, without these important resources or ecosystems, how damaging it could be to community life, uh, to our own geographic space. You know, we are dealing with coastal erosion, erosion at a very high rate and it's very concerning. Um, loss of our biodiversity and loss of livelihoods. What will people do in these communities that are affected? And uh, if, um, I, I have to a project for highlighting the, the example of Denry is a very, it, it is something that people should pay attention to because uh, if you speak to anyone from Denry, uh, even the grown folks, they will describe to you what the natural geography of that place used to be and what has changed. 
and continue to suffer from inundations year in year out, even when other places don't experience that type of, um, of impact. So in essence, what we want to do, and I think what we all want to accomplish is to have a situation where we understand what the value of our wetlands are and how, what are the things we could do to improve the conditions of these wetlands. And it doesn't have to be a, 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 a one or the other um, option. It's just a matter of uh, coordinating the efforts. It's also something with regards to taking into consideration what, what are the needs of the community as well. Mm -hmm. So sustainable livelihoods is something that we speak of all the time, but what does that mean? Mm -hmm. There are things that, again, the practice, and we have very good examples, the Opico and charcoal producers, and you have that collaboration there where they're able to um, practice even charcoal production. Now, you might say that charcoal production is antithetical to carbon because it produces carbon. But uh, the reality of the solution space or life is that we use charcoal, and it is something that you have to um, um, contend with. So when things are done sustainably, um, you have the, the, the importance and the critical issue is that you have to have, be practical about things. You have to give people information so they can make proper de decisions. Mm -hmm. And you also have to consider um, uh, the elements, how, how far, wh what are the alternatives. So if, for instance, the charcoal production becomes an issue where it's really um, something that we can no longer practice, then what are the alternatives? What, what are you going to ask people to do instead of doing charcoal production? So uh, I have worked, and many of us have worked with community groups to consider alternatives in terms of livelihoods, where there's honey production. Again, something that is also um, important to the environment um, with bees and the importance of bees and how they, they are useful for our flora. Um, and so these are things that many people over the years have worked very hard and considerable resources have gone into it. And I always say, you know, I will repeat and I will, I will applaud Magdalene for saying there is a dearth of information out there. It's not, there's, it is not for lack of data or understanding. There is an enormous amount of data, a lot of research. Donors now do not even want to fund research projects. They want to see action on the ground. And that is the, that is the essential element. When people see things happen, then they, they start to believe. So some of us learn by reading, and some of us learn by seeing what, what, what goes on in the community and what, what works. So I think it's time to practice what works, what really comes out, the activities, and to focus on that and, and try our best to, to deliver best practice for St. Lucia. Right? That's the important thing. It's, it's, it's indigenous, it is ours. We all can benefit from that. And I think the, the St. Lucia National Conf Conservation Fund is ready to work with any agency, any project, because we have had discussion with Mr. Calix to see how we can um, create synergies among our various activities, because that's the other thing. We, we tend to do operating silos in St. Lucia. Mm. So I don't know if it's a matter of I don't know. I don't want to speculate too widely. But anything, what I'm saying is that it makes sense that we should all try to see what are you doing and then I can join you. What I can, uh, we can pool our resources to do. It makes no sense in, you know, San is too small for that kind of yeah. thing. So um, we've had discussions before on, on that with Mr. Calix and with the forestry department. And I'm glad to hear of the collaboration with the, the Southwest Community College because we ourselves have approached the college trying to see how we could provide skills through you know learning and skills and information that's it we have a, we, we we do have a had a project with uh, the South Lewis Community College we provided equipment environmental monitoring equipment and that at that through that the students gain the skills in terms of the use of the equipment but mm -hmm. from that they will get some essential data of areas like mangroves and and wetlands that we that is very lacking because more and more it, it is a, it, it is something where we do not pay attention to it and I think that is one of the problems as well that we if something we don't see something we don't hear of it then it's not important mm -hmm. so I think um, 
I've said some, some sufficient <laughs> analysis. Thank you, Mr. Henry. We're running out of time, yeah, sure. um, but it, it would be an atrocity, uh, viewed as an atrocity by uh, the regular St. Lucian who's been uh, listening and watching the news in the last couple of years uh, to not bring up the uh, contention that, that has been sparked by the prospect of development at the, Man the Makote site. Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Justin, if you could just speak to us about the the position of the Department of Forestry uh, as it pertains to the Makote site and any uh, prospect of development there. It is important for us to discuss land tenure before I see Forestry Department's perspective. Forestry's depart forestry Department's interest is in conserving flora and fauna. However, the land belongs to Invest in Lucia. Well, speak to us about then the the threat that well, with well, the the risk that we are faced with should the Makote site be taken over by development. Everything we've said today, every contribution, has added to why it will be an atrocity if this development continues, or if such development across the country, if it happens. Um, we lose biodiversity daily. And some of the species that we lose, because we have so little information on many of them, we don't even know what we're losing. We don't know how to begin to re re reclaim it because we've lost things that we didn't even know we lost. Um, I think we are tethering on the, on the brink of disaster. Like I said, Viewfort is below sea level. Persons who know the history of how Viewfort came about will understand why it is important that everything that is done in relation to the Atlantic Ocean be handled carefully. Viewfort came about as a result of a massive slide, which means that we are still vulnerable now. Anything can still happen now. So the actions that we are taking, the decisions that we are making in terms of protecting, creating the barrier, or keeping the barrier, the natural barrier that we have, which is the mangrove. This is the stopgap for us. If you were to walk, Ms. Leos, along um, the beach from, from Lobster Port and get all the way to Boishado, you will experience so many different types of, the experience will be so different. Uh, Coconut Bay experiences a massive surge of seawater, inundating their, their grounds. However, on the same stretch, when you get to Boishado, the experience is different. And the only thing that is different is that the mangrove is still there. The, the mangrove was removed to construct this hotel. I cannot give you a better ex example. On this same stretch, you have the, 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 the land that is secure from the beach at, at Boishado to where the mangrove is, is almost beyond a mile. But right on the beach, we have lost the entire seafront where Coconut Bay is. That is what is, is in store for Viewfort, for instance, if we do not reclaim the mangrove, regreen it, replant it, ensure that the fresh water comes, whatever is blocking it, bring it back. So that, and in some instances, you have the nursery that Makote or charcoal, the charcoal people are doing, um, and we're planning to plant. In some instances, if you remove the hindrances from whatever is causing the blockage, the mangrove has the potential, the ability, to regreen. Adjacent healthy mangroves can produce seeds that can cause regreening on its own without having to plant a single um, raised seedling. Mm -hmm. Unless we have the mindset that what we need to do is to re reclaim and restore, we are in for trouble. And to add to that, Jesse, um, mm -hmm. a lot of times, we negate the fact that it's a trade-off, that you're trading your mangrove for a development. 
but your mangrove comes, it provides a service that without it, it would cost you something. So the valuation, mm -hmm. the economic benefit that a, that a mangrove provides is that if you didn't have mangrove, you would have lost X amount of dollars in infrastructural damage. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times, persons don't try to make the connection that if there was no mangrove, then this road would have been destroyed. Mm -hmm. And that can be for cost. So ecosystems need to be evaluated, whether it's a mangrove or a forest, but it had a value, um, it, 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 you can put a monetary value to it. And if we do that now, we can see that by giving up these ecosystems, this is the cost, the, the, the dollars and cents cost of losing that ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And once we start doing that, then it, it paints a clear picture for policy because say that, okay, it, 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 it's cost me $5 million more a year to maintain this road. Mm -hmm if I remove this piece of forest or I remove this mangrove. Mm -hmm. So if you could put it in dollars and cents, which pol with policymakers like to see, they like to see the dollars and cents part of it. If they don't see the dollars and cents, it doesn't really make, it's not, it's not appealing to them if mm -hmm. they don't see the dollars and cents. Mm -hmm. So if you could, if you could provide information in monetary terms, that if you give up X, you're going to spend Y, then maybe it's a situation where now they're more amicable to putting more support towards environmental conservation and environmental stewardship. Mm -hmm. That's okay. what I think. Mm -hmm. And finally, I uh, just want to get a uh, word from you, Mr. Edmund, on the ongoing efforts from a policy standpoint, um, the, also the 20, uh, in keeping with the 2030 agenda, SDGs, uh, the work that's happening at the Department of Sustainable Development in the conservation of our wetlands, whether it be part of something or on its own. Okay, so from the, from the department standpoint, for wetlands in particular, wetlands falls under the Ramsar Convention, which the focal point is not how it's sustainable, but at forestry. But in terms of just general conservation, I think the wetlands are a source of a rich source of biodiversity for for our island because for in particular our two Ramda sites. You have a lot of migratory birds which come there, you have a lot of local endemics which birds which live there and and as a habitat. So in terms of biodiversity conservation, let's, let's look at it from that point and not just wetland conservation, but in terms of biodiversity conservation, it's these are important areas that we need to pay attention to because Every year, hundreds of species like Magdalene are, are being lost. Every, every year, we, we lose them. Hundreds of species were extinct. And some of, some, some, some of them, you have very little information on, so you can't even begin to see how you could get them back or, or increase their, their, their populations. But mm -hmm. from a department standpoint, I mean, we're trying to get policy that would, or legislation to strengthen biodiversity in, in St. Lucia, I think we have mm -hmm. one bill in draft form at the agent office is for biosafety and there's another one we're trying to push through on sustainable use and conservation. We're trying to push down through as well. Uh, we, we, we recently submitted an instrument with, well, we, plan, we, we submitted an instrument for accession to the Niagara Protocol on access to benefit sharing for biodiversity and the utilization of its products. So from a policy level, we're trying to get persons to understand that biodiversity is important. And there are benefits that you could gain from the use of biodiversity, be it in a wetland, in a forest, and these benefits could be for livelihoods, for for for, for personal livelihood, for economic. You could get for food security and nutrition. You could have for medicine and just you could have ecosystem just to improve the human well-being. Because studies have shown that just being in a healthy environment mm -hmm. could have many beneficial effects on the on the human body. It relieves stress. 
So these areas that we have, we need to, well, and we, 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 we need our policy makers to, to put some more support behind developing or, well, we have a lot of policy, but we need implementation of this policy. We have a lot of policies that have been endorsed by different cabinets, uh, but they are not fully implemented. And that's what we need to do now. We, we, we need to implement these policies that a lot of work has gone into the, to, to develop. So we need to now implement these policies and get persons to even know about this policy, because there are many policies that you could think of that a lot of people don't even know about. Mm -hmm. And even me, there are things that I'm, I'm finding out that I didn't know before, because there are areas which are protected areas on the books that I didn't even know about, like shock mm -hmm. and Bois these mangroves are protected mangroves, but when you go in these areas, the level of degradation that you see, you would not think that this is a gazetted protected area, mm -hmm. but it is. So a lot, there, are, there are a lot of things that policies and, and protection, protection sites that people don't even know about, because mm -hmm. it was done so long ago that, and like Pablino said, because of land tenure issues, yeah, people forget. So, from the policy standpoint, we're just trying to implement policy and get transformative change from these policies that are already existing and those that we plan to develop. Thank you very much for that. Implementation, action. Mm -hmm. Wetlands Action for People and Nature, the theme for this year's observance of World Wetlands Day 2022. Uh, it is the 2nd of February 2022, and this theme is grounded in the appeal to invest financial, human, and political capital to save the world's wetlands. Uh, you just heard from a comprehensive, uh, a comprehensive view there from, uh, as I indicated in my introduction, a distinguished panel, uh, experts and executives, persons who are on the forefront of uh, restoring and protecting, conserving our wetlands here in St. Lucia. I would like to thank the panel, Mr. Jeremiah Edmund from the uh, Department of Sustainable Development, also from the Department of Sustainable Development, Mr. Calixt, uh, Mr. Henry from the National Conservation Fund, uh, Ms. Gerson from the Department of Forestry, also uh, off, the, off the platform, we have Mr. Clark, uh, who came all the way from Viewfort, also head ranger for the Point Sabs, Environmental Protection Area from the National Trust and Ms. Felix, Makiba Felix, fisheries biologist from the Department of Fisheries there, giving us an outline of, you know, the work that has been ongoing to understand our wetlands a little bit more and the impact, the benefit that they have uh, for our country. I'd like to thank you so much for watching. It's all the time we have for now. The producers are calling. Uh, do enjoy the rest of your observance for World Wetlands Day 2022 and we do hope that you have time to ponder some of the ways in which you and your community, uh, whatever you can do if you have a wetland in your area, can do to conserve, reverse degradation, or re reverse the damage that has been done in your own area and see how you could partner with organizations like the NC NCF, like the Southeast Coast uh, Project, like the Department of Fisheries, Forestry, to really bring our wetlands back to where they once were. My name is Jesse Leon signing off for now. Do stay tuned for more programming. Goodbye. Thank you.